Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today it is uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome you all. And I'd like to start with uh, inviting Professor Ahmed Halawa. Professor, and he is uh, well known for us. And he, he invited, uh, I think, one of the uh, key players in uh, transplantation, Professor Sharma. And uh, I ask Professor Halawa to introduce him. Please, Dr. Halawa. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussain. Um, you know, um, um, AJ Sharma, we used to call each other twin brothers. He is my twin brother. However, you know, born different time from different mom and dad and different countries. Um, AJ, his first name, he works as a consultant transplant uh, at Royal Liverpool University Hospital. Uh, this uh, transplant unit is a very busy unit. They do uh, more than 120, 130 kidney transplants. Used to be kidney and pancreas, but they drop, they drop the pancreas. Uh, AJ is a, um, a pioneer. However, he started after me, but he, you know, he, he passed me now in dual kidney transplantation, marginal kidneys, uh, and also, um, uh, this unit is a campus induction unit. So I thought it is quite uh, beneficial and, um, you know, to uh, get his experience, how to use campus in terms of side effect of campus, especially, especially as far as you remember, AJ, you know, they reported the mortality as well from using IV campus. Uh, so it's always a good practice to learn from our mistakes. Uh, I will hand it back, you know, the discussion to you, Professor Hussain. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Halawa. And unmuted, Professor Sharma. Professor Sharma. You are welcome with us. You are welcome with us today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So this is the, uh, a special meeting because it is impossible to discuss everything about immune suppression in one or two sessions. So why, this is why we selected some points that we are going to speak about. Today, this is the team of Urology and Nephrology Center, Mansoor University, which is well known by transplant activity. Also, it is my honor to have uh, our godfather, Professor Muhammad Sobh, attending with us uh, this day in the meeting. Uh, so the, today, um, we are going to discuss as a unit, as a team, uh, uh, special issues about immune suppression, then the team of uh, clinical pharmacy at the center will discuss generic immune suppressions and biosimilars. And one of uh, very promising uh, new consultants, Professor Dr. Ahmed Denewer, will discuss in uh, an interesting way the electrolytes disorders uh, accompanying immune suppressive use. Let me to start. Uh, I'm going to uh, start this meeting with uh, just highlighting the policy of immune suppression. And the last Wednesday, Professor Tarek Fayyad gave us a talk about induction and some armamentarium of antibody mediated rejection. So we're not going to repeat what was mentioned in the last Wednesday. But this is a situation of maintenance immune suppressive drugs used currently. Cyclosporin is vanishing and it's almostly replaced by tacrolimus. And when we reviewed our data at Urology and Nephrology Center, we found that among immune suppressive drugs, the use of tacrolimus was significantly associated with better survival. So this is the current, since more than seven years, tacrolimus is the backbone of immune suppressive drugs at our center. The same, what happened with cyclosporin, happened with azacyobrin. Azacyobrin is replaced almostly by microphenolate, either microphenolate mofetel or microphenolate sodium. Uh, but uh, as you know, in uh, situations like pregnancy, uh, we stop uh, microphenolate and replace by other cell brain. And in th the same scenario, if we have intolerance for microphenolate, the way that we have is to replace by other cell brain. And this is for steroid, and this is one of the starting points in this meeting. Do you uh, uh, encourage steroid withdrawal or not? This is a situation of uh, steroid use in adult kidney transplant recipient at the time of transplantation, this color, and at year of transplantation, almost more than 
70% are maintained on steroids. And 30%, there was a success to stop steroid. And this was of very nice points that was discussed in one's day, and this is in pediatric. So I'm going to start with this uh, uh, paper. This is a 15-year outcomes from University of Minnesota showing that rapid discontinuation of prednisone, and this is very important. If the patient is a low risk and we decided for steroid discontinuation, it should be done perfectly within one week, and we shouldn't uh, try discontinuation after two weeks. And this is what we adopt. Th the result of this study, as you see, rapid discontinuation of prednisone is a darker line, so it is even better in survival, in living, and cadaveric transplantation. If we, if we say there is no difference in graft survival, even, but significantly, there was a reduction of corticosteroid-related side effects, like a vascular necrosis, metabolic profile abnormalities, uh, infections, ATC. So if the patient in, in low immunological risk, especially if, if the patient is in pediatric age, but we should be cautious to calculate immunological risk in a perfect way, because we don't like to uh, start with rapid discontinuation of steroid and then to have rejection and the graft failure. So we should be in a wisdom uh, of the balance of immune suppressive drugs. And this, this table shows the survival uh, again and again from this uh, 15 year follow up of Minnesota experience, the uh, rapid discontinuation of prednisone was successful. This is our randomized controlled study, including this number of patients, as you see in the, sli in the bottom of the, uh, the slide. Uh, we have the principal immune suppression is steroid, tacrolimus mycophenolate mofetil in the control arm, preceded by basiliximab induction. And in the investigational arm, and it, it, is, uh, it was a randomized controlled study, uh, induction with basiliximab followed by uh, rapid discontinuation of prednisone within seven days of transplantation. And you will learn that when we stop prednisolone, what happens to tacrolimus level increases because prednisolone is enzyme inducer. What are the results? This is the, the steroid avoidance or rapid discontinuation of steroid was associated with significant reduction of post-transplant diabetes, 5% in, this, in the group of uh, rapid steroid withdrawal, uh, compared to 15% in the control. The same hypertension is reduced from 80% in maintained steroid to 40% in steroid uh, rapid discontinuation group. So we learn it to adopt this protocol for all low immunological risk, principally children and adults if they are fulfilling the criteria. And the criteria is to have binary reactive antibody zero or at most less than 10%, and mismatch should be less than HLA, and they are less than three uh, uh, out of six. Graft and division survival uh, showing a, a satisfactory results, no difference, and so this is the, what we do. But again, we should be wise in reducing immune suppression in renal transplant recipient, because this is one of the articles that appeared in the current issue of transplantation June this year, showing that immune suppression withdrawal or minimization in HLA identical renal transplant, and this is a very nice study, including a large number of patients of HLA uh, identical renal transplant, what, the, uh, what is the, uh, there? If you look here at the multivariate analysis of graft rejection, you'll find the odds ratio for rejection was 26 fold higher in those with minimize, secondary minimization. So we should be cautious, especially in young aged adults because the, the risk of rejection may outweigh any benefit that we have from minimization.
Again, in the multivariate analysis of graft rejection in patients without previous transplantation, 19-fold the odds ratio uh, of uh, uh, rejection due to secondary minimization. Multivariate analysis of graft rejection in patients even without anti chile antibodies before transplantation, again, secondary minimization was associated with 42-fold increased risk of rejection. So we should be meticulous. We should assess the patient by all the facilities, immunological, DSA, uh, follow-up, uh, even biopsy before going to adopt drastic reduction of immune suppression. Tacrolimus is the backbone of immune suppressive nowadays in, in Egypt, in the United States, I think in Europe uh, as well. Uh, so this is the, how tacrolimus work. This is the immune response if we don't have tacrolimus. If the antigen is presented to antigen presenting cell, antigen binds it to T cell receptor. And here we have calcium inside the cell, calmidulin. So calcium calmidulin complex stimulates calcineurin. Calcineurin has phosphatase effect on the nuclear factor of activated T lymphocyte. So calcineurin removes phosphate from nuclear factor of activated T lymphocytes. And after uh, getting rid of these two phosphates, what happens? Nuclear factor of activated T lymphocyte becomes stimulated, enter the nucleus, stimulate release of interleukin two and others. This is a situation if we don't give uh, calcium inhibitor, and here I'm speaking about tacrolimus. Tacrolimus, when it's taken, absorb it, and it finds its way to the cell, when it, uh, where it binds to its receptor, immuno specific immunophilin binding, which is FK binding protein, and making this complex, this complex inhibits the calcineurin. So inhibition of calcineurin will lead to inhibition of nuclear factor of activated T lymphocyte, Nuclear factor activated lymphocyte entry to the nucleus is reduced with subsequent reduction of cytokine. So this is the mechanism of action. And I give it to, uh, the mechanism a long time because I'm going to use this mechanism uh, in the sector of how to monitor tacrolimus. The major problem that we face and all over the world face is high variability intra-patient, and this is a problematic, and inter-patient variability. Intra-patient variability may be associated with uh, taking the medicine with food or without food. If tacrolimus is taken away from food, this increases the bioavailability by 30%. If it's taken by food, it reduces, food reduces the absorption and the bioavailability by 30%. We should be careful about that. Interpatient variability may be related to different en en enzymatic activity. Again, if there is high intrapatient tacrolimus variability, we may have under immune suppression or over immune suppression because variability may be to the right side or to, to the left side. Both of them are bad because under immune suppression will be linked to under immune suppression and rejection and over immune suppression will be related to complication like renal toxicity and others and mortality. So both high and low levels are uh, uh, very bad. I'm going to highlight two important points from the pharmacokinetic aspects of tacrolimus. One of them is time in therapeutic range. So I advise myself and my colleagues whenever we follow up transplanted patient is to look at the serial level of tacrolimus through different follow-up, through all of the follow-up uh, uh, lab parameters. If the patient has uh, low time in therapeutic range, this means that more than 40% of the follow-up tacrolimus is lower than the therapeutic range, this is a real risk. So we should maintain the nice looking at the tacrolimus level for a serial time. We may uh, get the benefit from the pharmacology, from the clinical pharmacist to uh, help us in this point or to help ourselves by uh, looking at the serial levels of tacrolimus. If we have the patient with 
uh, all the time the chronomus is below the therapeutic range, this patient may be associated with complication. As you see here, de novo DSA, acute rejection, and uh, death sensor, the graft loss. If you look here to the de novo DSA, if time to th in therapeutic range is less than 40%, the odds ratio is 2.8 uh, fold to develop de novo DSA. If we take uh, TAC less than eight nanogram per ml at the therapeutic range. If, it, if we take it uh, uh, six nanogram per ml, uh, the same. If the time in therapeutic range is less than 40%, there is a higher risk for development of de novo DSA, acute rejection, and here acute uh, uh, death sensor graft loss. Another point in the pharmacokinetic, which is very simple. I'm not speaking about genetic testing, but a tomato study. This is tacrolimus metabolization in kidney transplantation. We can expect tacrolimus metabolism just by looking at concentration and the tacrolimus concentration trough level by nanogram per ml to the dose per milligram. Uh, to approximate this point, if you are treating two patients, and the two patients have a tacrolimus level of uh, eight nanogram per milliliter. So the level is eight. And the first patient, the dose is just two milligram, one milligram every uh, 12 hours. So concentration to dose ratio for this patient is eight divided by two equal four. Suppose that in the second patient you use 10 milligram, five milligram twice a day. So eight divided by 10 means less than one. So if concentration divided by dose, nanogram per ml divided by milligram is less than one, this denotes that this patient is fast metabolizer, even if we don't have genetic testing. So the very low concentration dose ratio is associated with outcome with survival, less survival. This is the patient with a normal concentration dose, with normal metabolism, and the blue color is those who have a low concentration dose ratio and the metabolism is high or fast. If you look here, con if concentration dose is less than one, this is increased hazard ratio for this sensor graft loss. Uh, so, and uh, I think this is a nice, good point to be followed. We need to know serial follow-up of the acrylimus, and we need to know concentration and dose for each patient to know the nature of the metabolism of each one. Let us go to the one of the very exciting point. What we have nowadays uh, regarding the acrylimus, we have three types. Immediate release tacrolimus, prolonged release, which is famous here in Egypt, Advagraph. And there is a new one, a newer one of improved pharmacokinetics, LCBT or inversus. So we have three types, immediate release, two prolonged release, one Advagraph, and the other is inversus. And I'm going to ask Professor Halawa and the, the, his team about the use of inversus. Uh, do, do you have experience in using this or not after the end of this point? So this, is, this study compared uh, 33 patients on the new form in Versus, which is LCBT, versus the Advagraph, 33 versus 35. The dose, look at the dose, please. The dose in, in Versus is 0.17 milligram per kg per day. But for Advagraph, it is 0.2 milligram per kg per day. Because we have the lesson here, that when we shift from immediate release tacrolimus prograph to Advagraph, we uh, multiply by 1.2 to have the same level because Advagraph needs a time for, uh, uh, dev uh, for developing a level. But the newer one, which is LCBT, it seems that it is one to one or even eight 0.81 to because of improved pharmacokinetics. Another study, and this is the uh, multi-dose, the, the technology of the newer tacrolimus by using multi-dose, 
which inject tacrolimus after its absorption by oral form, it find its way to the lower part of the intestine. So it bypasses the first part of the intestine. In Spain, there are the three types are there, and this study tested the multi dose technology, which improves the solubility of tacrolimus and thereby its bioavailability by dispersing tacrolimus in polymeric matrix. So LCBT means that tacrolimus is taken through this uh, matrix uh, and it disperses tacrolimus to be absorbed in a nice way and to be bumped into the distal part of the intestine. What is the advantage of uh, reaching this lower part of intestine? This lower part of the intestine uh, has lower concentration of cytochrome system. Because cytochrome system, which is responsible about the metabolism of tacrolimus, is present in liver and in the upper part of a small intestine by high concentration. And the, in the lower part of the intestine, it is lower. So the new, pharm new pharmacokinetics allows better absorption and the less metabolism of uh, the new tacrolimus form. In this study, they converted 365 patients from either immediate release tacrolimus prograph or advagraph to the newer inversus, which I'm speaking about. If you look here, concentration dose ratio that I just mentioned in a minute is better with inversus. If you compare it to prograph, it is in. Uh, uh, better than Advagraph. And this is a very nice review in transplantation review in this April, discussing how to use tacrolimus and I'm advocating all of you to read. But if you look at the curve of LCBT, this is a curve of inversus. It doesn't attain very high level, so the peak is not very high, but the, the level is maintained all the time. So the pharmacokinetic curve is the best for inversus. And, they, and uh, 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 we, we, are, we are thinking to find a way to have this drug or to, uh, to ask those who are experienced with using this drug. I know it is present in Spain, in Italy, and other countries, and I think it will be used uh, more and more. Regarding tacrolimus personalized therapy, this is one of the very nice article uh, about the consensus, second consensus report about the therapeutic drug monitoring of tacrolimus personalized therapy in 47 pages, including very nice points. Nuclear factor of activated lymphocytes, do you remember the mechanism of action? Nuclear factor of activated lymphocytes is the start of pharmacodynamic effect. It's not pharmacokinetic. So either monitoring the nuclear factor of activated activated lymphocytes or its regulated gene expression. And as you see here, this is the evidence of recommendation. B, moderate evidence, and two, it is uh, accepted recommendation. And monitoring intracellular T cell interferon gamma production by iliospot. So a lot of uh, innovations in monitoring of tacrolimus to ensure its efficacy. And I find this point very interesting. This is why we have nowadays MED thesis, about the nuclear factor of activated T lymphocyte related gene expression in those who are those patients who are admitted because of rejection or because of over immune suppression. To, uh, because all of them are within therapeutic range from the pharmacokinetic point of view, then we want to assess pharmacodynamic. And I think if this, this test becomes available, combining trough level plus pharmacodynamic assessing the action, I think it will be the best to avoid complications in immune suppression. And again, this is the table, shows all pharmacodynamic biomarkers to assay and the assay platform to assess the acrylimus. Either measuring even calcineurin activity by these types of assay or others. I'm not going to bother you by these details, but the last point in the tacrolimus before discussion in this point, is the genotyping. And again, we have uh, a, a nice thesis uh, with the collaboration with a center in Europe to test the pharmacogenetic 
uh, of the anisotropin B3 A5 uh, for tacrylomastrated recipients. And this is the current consortium recommendation. If you have the genotype, which here is homozygous non-expressor, the standard dose is 0.15 milligram per kg per day. If the patient is heterozygous expressor and non-expressor, the dose should be higher one, uh, instead of 0.15 to be increased uh, 1.5 to two times and don't exceed 0.3 milligram per kg per day. And if the patient is homozygous expressor, this means a fast metabolizer, increase the dose the same uh, but don't exceed 0.3 milligram per kg per day as a starting dose, and then to monitor the level and to uh, adjust the dose according to the level. Uh, nowadays, there is a proposed revision of this consortium guidelines. If the patient is homozygous, non-expressor, even they reduce starting dose to 0.14 milligram per kg per day. And nowadays, we reduced our, our therapy and at urology and nephrology center in the starting point was 0.3. Nowadays, we use 0 0.1, 0 0.1 milligram per kg per day divided on two doses. This is if the patient is non-expressor, 0 0.14 milligram per kg per day. If the patient is heterozygous, expressor or non-expressor, the dose to be increased to 0 0.2 to 0 0.25 milligram per kg per day. If the patient is homozygous expressor, the dose even may exceed 0 0.3 milligram per kg per day up to 0.4 milligram per kg per day. I find this data is very valid, especially for children, because ch we expect the metabolism is fast in children. And it's better to start with higher dose in children because intestine is short, metabolism is fast. And if we start with the traditional dose, this will be associ maybe associated with rejection. I, I, I would like to stop here just to have some points and comments on this point of presentation. Dr. Halal. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hussain. Actually, I have, uh, uh, you know, a few comments, if you don't mind, and, uh, yeah, okay. and I would like to make them very short. Uh, you mentioned tacrolimus, okay? And of course, tacrolimus is the backbone of uh, immune uh, backbone of any immune suppression protocol in UK, Egypt, worldwide, anywhere except in you know certain places in the in, in the states where you know uh, black um, african american are uh, being disadvantaged because uh, this part of the world is insurance driven uh, so um but we have to remember when basiliximab was introduced was introduced in cyclosporin based immunosuppression protocol and never been tested that basiliximab will prevent rejection in tacrolimus era. And for a you know, uh, developing country, we strongly believe that basiliximab is a waste of money if you're going to use tacrolimus. And we, you know, my research group published a paper recently, to, I think a month ago, in American Journal of, um, uh, of Nephrology about the outcome, UK outcome, uh, it was, was meta-analysis, UK outcome of basiliximab uh, in tacrolimus and versus no basiliximab. And the evidence is very clear that basiliximab didn't offer any advantage. So if we move to tacrolimus, we have to stop basiliximab. Uh, the second thing uh, I would like to comment uh, and quickly as well, you mentioned PRA as well. PRA is only a panel of 50 donors. Uh, again, it won't give you a, a good idea about the, the, uh, the immunological risk of the recipient. Uh, we moved in the States and Europe to what's called CPRA, calculated panel reactive antibodies. And, and you know, uh, uh, in UK, they are quite awkward. They call it uh, CRF calculated reaction frequency. So basically, instead of having 50, a panel of 50, the panel of 10,000 normal healthy blood donors. So this will give you a better idea about the immunological risk of the recipient rather than the PRA. PRA is variable. If you've got another 50 or a panel of 50, you might get different results. 
the third thing actually, which is quite interesting, the genetic workup. Um, genetic workup, it costs thousands of pounds. And to some, you know, sometimes it takes months and months to get the results back. The question is, do we need it? Simply, you can check the level, frequent levels. We like to make transplantation easy. We like, you know, not to add more, you know, more uh, hassles in terms of the ge genetics workup. And most of the genetic studies, by the way, will come up inconclusive, query, 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 query. So it will add more gray areas, uh, more mud, rather than make it clear. Uh, regarding our practice in, uh, in, in Sheffield, um, I'm sure Professor Sharma has a different idea. We use Adoport genetic uh, uh, tacrolimus. Uh, one to one, the conversion is one to one. What are the factors which uh, you know, made us to make this decision? Number one, the cost. We don't like to have an expensive drug. If we can get a cheaper one, it would be good. However, the government is paying for the immunosuppression, not us, but still we have to save money. Number two, the bioavailability. So these drugs, before being introduced, will check the bioavailability, basically the area under the curve. Make sure that you know, the degree of exposure is good enough to prevent side effects and meanwhile, to prevent rejection. So we'll do a pilot study to see whether the, uh, the new drug is associated with side effects or not, and we'll check the level. And uh, th those candidates for the pilot study are stable transplant patients. We'll, we'll consent them and we'll explain to them the situation and we'll try you know, the, uh, the generic one uh, uh, and compare it with uh, the, uh, the brand, which is Tacrolimus. So money driven while it is bioequivalent and they've been tested by simple pilot study. Um, I don't know whether uh, uh, AJ would like to make a comment on Liverpool experience. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Now I can speak, yes. Okay, the Liverpool experience is that uh, until, for about 30 years, that means uh, until the end of uh, last century, uh, we were cycle, so we were a unit which were using cyclosporin monotherapy mainly. And at the time, about uh, only 20% of the patients would be on steroids. But then, uh, and that means 80% of them were without steroids. But then, because of the allocation scheme, we started getting lots of patients who had uh, quite a lot of mismatch of HLA. And uh, therefore, we started getting uh, much more rejections. And uh, in the first decade, in the previous decade, about 33% uh, of the patients uh, were given steroids. That means about uh, two-thirds of them did not. Uh, at that time, uh, about 12 years ago, uh, the uh, CAMPATH was introduced in our department, and that was for anybody whose is not a standard risk. The standard risk patients would be given the dual therapy uh, of uh, tacrolimus and MMF. That was after basiliximab uh, induction. Other patients, like those who had high PRA, anything more than 40% of uh, PRA, those who had previous craft loss because of rejection, those who had one, at least one DR mismatch, or patients uh, who were from the uh, TCD donors, they are given CAMPATH two doses. Uh, if they are under 60, so if they are, uh, uh, and if they are over 60, then we would give them only one dose. And we give only uh, subcutaneous therapy. So we have had two patients ha who have had quite severe reaction to it. One in whom it was given inadvertently intravenous and that patient uh, died because of the cytokine release. 
and another patient uh, was given uh, um, subcutaneous uh, uh, intravenous again inadvertently and developed a quite severe reaction and we had to really abandon the transplant and uh, bring that patient back to the ward. So what I'm trying to say here is that except for those two patients, uh, CAMPATH has really helped us a great deal in reducing the rejection rate, which is less than 10% now, which used to be 40% uh, uh, about 20 years ago in our ward. And uh, uh, CAMPATH has certainly helped us to save these patients from the use of steroids. So we have got two, two groups. One is those in whom we give Simulac, the standard risk patients, and those who are not with group. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharma, for your valuable comments. Regarding the points of uh, Professor Halawa, uh, uh, Basiliximab, yes, it was tested and introduced in the era of cyclosporin. And uh, I myself chaired in many uh, studies, randomized controlled the study following up Basiliximab after one year, three years, five years, uh, seven years, and 10 years. And all these articles were published in international journals. Uh, in the era of tacrolimus, there is a hot question. Do we really need, do we really need Basiliximab if we are going to give the patient tacrolimus on the microflint profitel as Professor Halawa mentioned? The answer is if the patient is a standard risk and uh, the patient will be maintained on a steroid, a tacrolimus and the microfinillate mofetel, there is no evidence for any advantage of basiliximab. But if we are planning, planning for steroid withdrawal, this, this will be, the, again, th this will leave a room for uh, giving basiliximab as induction therapy. Regarding the calculated BRA, in our center nowadays, we are using Luminex technology. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping and dreaming to have uh, the data for 5,000 or 10,000 patients from Egyptian uh, race. Uh, for them, we have all the genotyping to have calculated BRA. But we shifted to the Luminex technology and they calculated the MFI related to the uh, the HLA uh, engines present on the beads. And we ho hope to have the calculator in the near future. Regarding the third part, which is the generic one, I'm going to leave the generic tacrolimus to the talk of the generic and the biosimilar. So almost we agree together, Dr. Halawa, if we are going to use uh, basiliximab with triple immune suppressive therapy, steroid tacrolimus, microfilm mofetel in, in low immunological risk, I think it adds nothing. But if we think to uh, get rid of a steroid, I think this is a good rationale for continuing basiliximab in these cases. Uh, regarding the everolimus, I'm going fast because uh, I'd like to co convey some important messages. Everolimus nowadays is introduced after the transform study that included more than 2,000, more than 1,000 HR. They tested in the transform study uh, standard dose calcium inhibitor, steroid, microfinite mofetel versus reduced dose uh, calcium inhibitors plus everolimus in the second arm. And everolimus is uh, taken from uh, de novo from the early beginning of transplantation. I want to say here interesting bit, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some interesting and practical point. If we will introduce everolimus with cyclosporin, Everolimus with tacrolimus, we should be careful. The dose of everolimus in tacrolimus arm is double the dose of everolimus in cyclosporin. Why? Because cyclosporin inhibits metabolism of everolimus. So the starting dose of everolimus with cyclosporin is 0.75 milligram twice a day. In tacrolimus, it is 1.5, the double the dose of cyclosporin arm because cyclosporin inhibits metabolism of everolimus. In the old drug, rabamycin, which is the, the second uh, member within the M2, uh, M2 inhibitors, if cyclosporin was there and we have a good experience, and from the center, 
there is a publication about five year, 10 year, 15 year experience with mTOR inhibitors, with rabamycin. If cyclosporin is given, uh, th there should be four hours apart from cyclosporin to rabamycin because cyclosporin inhibits the metabolism of rabamycin so much. That is not the case with everolimus. So we can give cyclosporin with everolimus. Uh, the last point in, in, in concordance to Professor Sharma comment regarding the use of CAMBATH. I think we have a, a pilot training experience in the CAMBATH that was published in the, one of the American journals. Uh, and the aim was to get rid of both calcium inhibitor and steroids. And in the first uh, couple of cases, we got the lesson that we should keep uh, tacrolimus for at least three months. So in the second part of our experience, we leave tacrolimus for three months, then to have a biopsy, and then to stop tacrolimus and leave the patient with uh, a steroid and serolimus. And if there is a repopulation of white cell, we add uh, MMF. So we have a humble experience in campus use. Let us go back to the Everolimus uh, recommendation, and I'm going to concentrate on problems. If we treat the patient with Everolimus or rabamycin emitter inhibitors, one of the major problems is uh, uh, development of proteinuria. And according to the level of proteinuria, the action uh, will be. So if we have mild proteinuria, less than one gram, we can continue administration of Everolimus because we don't like to make hectic immune suppression protocol, and to administer ACE inhibitor or ARB, then assess the evolution. If proteinuria is reduced, nothing there, it's okay. If there is persistent to proteinuria, or proteinuria increase to the moderate degree, we here, we uh, do biopsy to assess the presence of glomerulonephritis or rejection. And if we have severe proteinuria above two gram or nephrotic, we uh, do biopsy, uh, to assess the situation and will stop everolimus in this category of patients. This is the, the, from this uh, recommendation, but what we do in our center, we don't like proteinuria. This is why we, uh, uh, we act in a step ad in advance uh, in comparison to this recommendation. So we do biopsy and then assess if we stop or not the everolimus if we have proteinuria within the range of one gram per day. Regarding edema, edema also a complication of immature inhibitors. Edema can be classified into mild to moderate or severe up to lymphedema. And we have a case of lymphedema in the upper arm related to the use of immature inhibitors. If we have edema, uh, this is the, uh, how the, the management and the follow-up. If it is mild, we can continue administration of immature inhibitors, targeting level to be four to five nanogram per ml, and uh, through the years, we learned how to use everolimus. So we use everolimus with tacrolimus in our center, uh, in the, one of the, our randomized controlled studies. And we follow rule of 10. Uh, in the starting days of transplantation, the sum level of tacrolimus and everolimus is 10. In the start, in the few days after transplantation, uh, everolimus to be around three nanogram per ml, to avoid one, one dehiscence and the complication, and to leave tacroma seven to have potent immune suppression. And after a month of transplantation, we can shift at the end of the day, tacrolimus A3 and everolimus seven. So rule of seven is very nice and simple way to calculate the dose of both tacrolimus and everolimus. If we have mild edema, we can reduce the dose uh, and to attain lower level, but shouldn't be less than three. If edema persists and level beyond three, it's better to stop and to shift to another drug rather than continuing everolimus. If the patient has severe edema, it's better to discontinue everolimus, especially if there is lymphedema and consider shifting to mycophenolate. Is there a real difference between immature inhibitors and mycophenolate mofetel? As I mentioned, transform showed non-inferiority of everolimus plus reduced dose of calcium inhibitor to the standard dose plus mycophenolate. But this is the meta-analysis for 24 studies, including more 7,000 participants, showing that no difference in rejection 
between immature inhibitors and mycophenolate. Yes, there is no difference in mortality. Uh, there is no difference in graft loss. Uh, graft function may be a little bit better in the Everolumus in some uh, studies, but at large, no significant difference in uh, graft function as shown even in transform study and other studies. And I know Professor Halawa published an article about immature inhibitors and it be, to be careful about rejection. CMV infection is re significantly lower in CMV treated in the Everolumus treated patients. So this is an advantage of Everolumus. But be careful, Everolumus is not a drug to treat CMV. And this is a case out of out the transplantation metastatic breast cancer treated with Everolumus and the patient developed uh, CMV colitis. So up to this moment, we should be cautious. Yes, for immature inhibitor based regimen, CMV is less, but again, this is an immune suppressive drug. The major problem in the immature inhibitor in comparison to mycophenolate is the rate of discontinuation and side effects. The rate of discontinuation, according to this meta-analysis, is around 46% in immature inhibitor treated patients in comparison to only 17% in mycophenolate. So I look at immature inhibitors as an arm that can be suitable for certain types of patients, for patients with some intolerance to mycophenolate. Uh, and I think uh, although TRANSFORM includes heterogeneous patients groups in induction and even in the maintenance, and even when they propose uh, reduced uh, uh, calcium inhibitor level, level was higher than uh, needed, than intended, uh, but it gave us the, uh, the trust how to use Everolumus in these patients. Professor Halawa, you have a publication about immature inhibitors, and I think your recommendation was uh, to, be, to be cautious uh, when shifting and considering immature inhibitor because of risk of rejection. Do you like to comment yeah. on this point? Oh, yeah. Basically, M2 inhibitor, when M2 inhibitor came to, you know, to play, we were actually, uh, you know, fascinated by a drug, uh, immunosuppressive drug, which is not nephrotoxic. And this proved to be complete lies because number one, it's nephrotoxic, it can cause proteinuria, and it took it to the proximal convoluted tubules. Not only that, we discovered later, we thought that, you know, um, uh, M2, uh, Everolimus or uh, uh, Ribomycin, or, you know, we can, we can stop CNI, which is um, tacronomous and cyclosporin. Uh, both these drugs are definitely nephrotoxic. We thought we'll spare, you know, uh, the kidney uh, unnecessary damage by CNI. And again, proved to be complete lies as well, because as you mentioned, the discontinuation rate was very high. Uh, uh, yeah, initially, I, I promoted, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, M2 inhibitor. Um, we used, uh, you know, uh, 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 Raba one uh, rather than Everolimus. But we discovered that patients actually come in complaining of all sorts of side effects, even with the smallest dose. Uh, in Sheffield. This, I can say, you know, confidently, no single patient stayed on M2 inhibitor. Oh. Also, when it is used as alternative, if the patient is C9 intolerant, or in case of, you know, patient with skin cancer and basal cell carcinoma, I think this is the best, uh, Dr. Halal, the best is to, to have Kabusi sarcoma and shifting from calcium inhibitor to yes, immature sir. inhibitor. This is the best indication. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was concluded in the British Association guidelines. That's right. And actually, this is the only way you can, you know, the only indication, the only two indications, patient intolerant to you know, CNI or a skin cancer. Uh, Kabusi actually had been shown by the Spanish group that you, when you treated with um, uh, with M2, they, they disappear, especially, you know, um, uh, wide, widespread uh, of Kaposi sarcoma, skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma. Uh, so it's advisable to think of M2, but be aware of the side effects. Okay. You know, it's a very poisonous drug. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, our experience here at the Urugia Nefer Center with both Rabamaisan and Nefer 
uh, rabomycin is uh, well published in the American Journal of Transplantation and other journals, uh, one year, five years, 10 years. And uh, every lumus we are just collecting the data. But we find by the days, we have some experience to use them because in the past we, uh, we uh, witnessed wounded hesence and uh, a lot of problem. And nowadays, I think the, the matter is uh, more and more, but I think uh, the conclusion of the meta-analysis is very nice. The rate of discontinuation is very high. So when we use them, we should master the using of them, the we want to use them and how to follow up them. Dr. Mohammed Kamal Assar, do, do you want to have a comment? Mohammed. Uh, yes, hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, I actually have a question, no, yes, not a comment. Please uh, ask your question, Mohammed. Yes. Uh, I asked about a case. I, uh, I made a case of uh, kidney transplant uh, since uh, more than 20 years. Uh, he developed the post transplant malignancy. About one year, he was uh, he received the chemotherapy. Which and type of malignancy, Mohammed? Which type of malignancy? Uh, as I remember, it is prostatic uh, carcinoma. Yes. Now with uh, lung and uh, bony metastasis, and he was uh, shifted uh, to uh, serolimus as monotherapy. Yes. With no, with no steroid, he developed a recent uh, a graft impairment, and uh, the biopsy revealed some degree of glomerular sclerosis, uh, no rejection. The creatinine did, didn't decrease, and he's now in serolimus monotherapy because he developed also uh, pneumonia. He, he's still living in Muhammad after metastasis. Yes. The tumor is eradicated. Uh, he will, yani the, uh, the oncologist uh, will subject him. He was subjected to radiotherapy and he will receive chemotherapy. So uh, thank you, Muhammad. Thank you. My, for the, my, my yes. question, what is the target uh, uh, okay. level, trough level in this case, in such okay. case? Thank you very much, Muhammad. Uh, Dr. Halal, do you like to comment on him? Or, or I'm going yeah, to uh, basically, yes. you know, in terms of uh, M, M, M tour, we'll take it as exactly like tacrolimus level. So if you have a graded, uh, 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 you know, let's just say, you know, immediate after transplantation level should be 10, uh, three months down the line should be eight, you know, uh, two years down the line would be five, something like that. The M tour for tacrolimus, and, and this is a rough guide. This is a rough guide. But uh, Dr. Halawa, um, uh, if Dr. Sharma wants to comment, I'm, I'll be happy. Dr. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Dr. Sharma. Yeah, regarding M tour, uh, I would say that uh, only in low risk patients uh, we would really. Uh, use it. We were, uh, we had lots of enthusiasm uh, long time ago, means uh, in first decade of uh, uh, you know this century. Uh, but uh, the problem is that quite many of them had developed uh, proteinuria, and okay. that has really dissuaded us from using it. And certainly, uh, it won't really have much role in as a de novo immunosuppression. But if uh, uh, over a period of uh, first three months of maybe first six months, we do realize that this patient is a low risk uh, uh, patient for rejection and has not developed rejection, then uh, we do tend to convert if there are reasons for that. Uh, but uh, starting it really- But the point, Dr. Sharma, the point in malignancy, do you find uh, uh, treating the patient with lung cancer by serolimus is a good choice with a patient who, who has uh, high creatinine? Uh, well, I, 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 am not, he, I am not convinced at all by the use of Everolomus in this case with high creatinine. It should and, be the yeah. GFR, actually. Oh. You know, um, you know, um, if, if, if you look at the same you know, um, you know, um, and you should use anybody with GFR less than 40 and proteinuria uh, more than 0.8 gram. Okay. So, uh, but you know. Dr. Hala, he, he, Dr. Sharma? Yeah, exactly same, exactly same figure. If the EGFR is uh, less than 40, yes. and if the protein year is uh, more than 800 milligram per day, then those patients are not suitable for conversion to mTOR inhibitor. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Uh, just to consolidate, Muhammad, uh, Dr. Muhammad Kamal, uh, regarding the, your case, uh, what we have from evidence 
is tumor like a bus sarcoma can take the benefit from shifting to uh, inhibitor inhibitors. Other malignancies, we need to balance overall immune suppression, and there is no convincing data for the advantage of immature inhibitors. This is the first point. To use immature inhibitor for any patient, either in the, within malignancy spectrum or not, we should look at GFR, and I agree with 40, per, 40 milliliter per minute, because this is the same that we decide here at the Urology and Infrared Center, 40 milliliter per minute, a secondary conversion for both immature inhibitor or even tacrolimus. So the, if the GFR is less than 40, it is very bad for the kidney, even if we are thinking of uh, away from malignancy. But for your case, it's better um, to look at the overall immune suppressive state rather than uh, concentrating only in serolimus. And I'm not sure if serolimus has anti-lung cancer effect or not. I'm not sure. And uh, it is a great doubt, a big doubt to have any benefit here. The problem is your case is complicated by pneumonia. And I'm not sure if it is interstitial pneumonitis from serolimus or pneumonia accompanying overall immune suppressive state because he has malignancy. So in this case, uh, it may be better to continue the patient if the, if the patient is chemosensitive and if the medical oncologist uh, uh, stated that the tumor is of cure, it's better to keep a, a small dose of steroid and a small level, a small window of tacrolimus rather than thinking of shift to overolimus or serolimus. Uh, uh, this is uh, to, the, uh, to my, the best of my knowledge. And this is the contrary if we have Kabusi. Kabusi, yes, we shift to uh, immature inhibitors. Uh, either Kabusi or not Kabusi, we should uh, look at the demographics of the patient. Protonuria, creatinine, GFR, lipogram, liver function test, all these to put in mind. For your case, if the graft function was okay, and I am in the situation, I stop antiproliferative, continue on a steroid and a small uh, dose or low window of tacrolimus rather than thinking of shifting to uh, serolimus. Dr. Halawad, what's... Yeah, I would like to ask the audience question. Uh, yes. you know, do you think, you know, the incidence of cancer in uh, mTOR inhibitor based immunosuppression is higher or lower than the normal population? A, a real difficult question, Dr. Halawa. No, the, uh, no, the answer is very clear. Theoretically, theoretically uh, it, uh, it is expected to be less with immature inhibitor treated patients. Surprisingly, but it's Surprisingly, <laughs> yes, I agree with you. <laughs> so this will tell you the idea that, you know, still immature inhibitor is immunosuppressive drug, is not anti-cancer. I would like to emphasize what Prof. Hussain said. You know, it's not anti-cancer treatment. You know, it's not used for cancer, but the, the, the proven benefit is for skin cancer, squamous, basal, and kaposi. But, but, but it is used as line of treatment for certain malignancy outside of transplantation. Like, uh, but in bigger dose, in, uh, in renal cell carcinoma and others, so there is some, some data about their anti-cancer effect in some diseases. It, it, it could be had, you know, but do you think in, in a massive dose, actually we are suffering, we have loads of side effects for small dose. Very know. difficult. Yeah. So and, uh, and I want to add a, a point here to the, the Dr. Muhammad Kamal Nassar case. I like this case because in the past we are occupied by the dogma. Immature inhibitors is anti-cancerous, should be used. Nowadays, uh, the, the only situation which is best fitting with this is Kabusi sarcoma. But we evaluate the patient before shift. If the patient is intolerant and we expect intolerance and the problems, we, uh, we don't uh, give uh, serolimus or, or everolimus and we think of reducing the other immune suppressive drugs. Yeah, I'll tell you something strange as well. If we have you know, a, a patient who's tacrolimus intolerant, we shift him to cyclosporin rather than serolimus. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Serolimus uh, is poisonous. <laughs> so you, you have the extreme. You have the extreme. Uh, so I'm going to shift to uh, another. So for malignancy, Muhammad, it's better to weight the balance and the benefit. If the tumor is of cure, maintain... Uh, a uh, uh, yeah, lower target immune suppressive drug to keep the graft functioning. 
because even if the tumor is not for cure, if you stop the immune suppressive and the patient had a graft failure plus metastasis, the patient will die. So it's better to keep the balance. Yes, we stop anti-proliferative, as the cerebrine, mycophenolate, you're giving a low window, tacrolimus, steroid. This is what we do nowadays. And we think for oncologists for definitive treatment. Regarding ca certain categories, if we uh, induce or treat elderly patients with immune suppressive, we should be careful about elderly and senior patients. I know Dr. Tari Tantawi likes uh, elderly and geriatric because this is a fragile group. Maybe because he is starting his way to <laughs> old age, but, but all, of, all of us actually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look at the pharmacokinetics of uh, of the drugs in elderly. Uh, the drug absorption is affected. Why? Because in elderly there is a reduction of gastrointestinal motility, decreases plankton blood flow. This is the effects of aging, gastrointestinal tract aged or ages, decrease the gastric emptying, increase the gastric pH, decrease the surface area of a small intestine. All these are encountered in elderly. So we expect defective absorption of immune suppression. Distribution of the drug is affected because uh, there is a reduction of lean body mass, decreased body water, increased body fat. The transporter within the intestine is affected. Metabolism. Reduction of proteins, liver, liver volume and the blood flow. Cytochrome system is reduced. Uh, renal function is re excretion, renal function is reduced and the biliary excretion uh, is reduced. So all parameters of pharmacokinetic are affected in elderly. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion are affected. To put in mind, this is why optimal immune suppression regimen elderly it's still unclear because studies, clinical trials usually uh, omit elderly persons from the trial, but we have the sense th there is immunosenescence uh, and there is increased risk of infections. So it is my point of view, it's better to uh, select best donor for the senior, best matching and uh, to avoid excessive immune suppression. There is, no, there is a lower risk of acute rejection, a higher risk of infection. Although there is a lower risk of acute rejection in the elderly, it's important to keep immune suppression uh, to avoid rejection. Interleukin receptor antagonist should be the standard. This is uh, to, to <laughs> for Professor Halal. Standard of care, induction therapy. Although low dose ATG should be considered in high risk recipients, especially if receiving a high risk donor. And the best is not to have, not, not to uh, adopt this policy, try to find the best donor. And I think one of the solution that I'm going to present is to activate bird donation program. Uh, lower dose calcium inhibitor may be required to achieve target level due to different pharmacokinetics in the elderly, which may reduce the risk of infection without increasing the risk of infection. Elderly patients should be included in clinical trials. Uh, induction immune suppression, uh, as I mentioned, interleukin 2 receptor antagonist, low dose ATG uh, in high risk uh, transplantation, maintenance immune suppression with calcium inhibitor is the preferred regimen. Therapeutic level can usually be achieved by using lower doses. So elderly patients may need lower doses to, um, and uh, when we discuss with Professor Barsoom, because he uh, prepared the Egyptian guidelines for uh, immune suppression. And one of the statements is to use lower dosages uh, of uh, immune suppression in elderly. Elderly transplant recipients are at higher risk of infection to both in mind uh, regarding the overall state of immune suppression. I think it is clear, but I would like to hear from uh, my great professor and the, the uh, godfather of nephrology in Mansoura, Professor Sobh, if he is still with us to have uh, to hear from him some points. Professor Sobh, please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, so, Professor Sobh, yes. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, overall, Jan, overall. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 from the beginning. Yes. Uh, uh, the story of um, uh, tackling illness and uh, cyclosporin. Yes. Uh, and the MMF and uh, azacyprine. Again, we have to look for the cost of treatment. We see Dr. Halawa is searching for generic in United States, in UK. I know that you agree about the concept 100% because I know from the clinic around your we opinion advances. We ourselves in, uh, as, uh, in our economy, yes. we have to do more research, not yes. to compete with the, uh, what to say, first world uh, countries or um, world countries. Highly, highly that is good research, uh, new ideas and new drugs, new immune suppression. But validity, I'm sure that we have uh, among uh, 100 patients we treat with TAC and um, MMF, at least 60% of them, you can treat them with cyclosporin. Uh, uh, you know, with pregnancy, we switch from MMF to azacyprine. And sometimes we don't go back to, to, to MMF and patient continue well. I think uh, our brain is manipulated. Not every patient need has, has to receive a, a, a prograf and not to receive cyclosporin. Not every patient mandatory have to take MMF and not as a separate. Uh, we have, I think, fraction of our patient can be treated with cyclosporin, not FK, without rejection. Some patients can be treated, still can be treated with ASA, without MMF, without rejection. So our research is how to find this 60% or 50% of patients so that we can cut short our uh, budget, we can, uh, we can save a lot of money. In the past, we tried with the ketoconazole and we could decrease 80% nearly of our immunosuppressive uh, uh, medication. But unfortunately, this, this ketoconazole has been withdrawn and instead, and instead some people still using it outside Asia. The point is that, as I, I, I'm going to say again, we have to do more research, searching for this 50% of people in whom we can use the cheaper and still effective immunosuppressive drugs as uh, cyclosporin and MMF. I'm not, uh, of course, I, I encourage uh, looking for the stronger dra drug, med stronger medication, uh, more patent immunosuppressive protocols, and sophisticated uh, a way to look for the to fill up the drug. I'm not against this. I encourage this. But as a local problem in Egypt, we have also encouraged research, searching for having the same success with less costly medication. This is my opinion. Uh, Regarding uh, uh, rabamycin and mTOR, uh, I think uh, in elderly it can be good uh, with small dose uh, calcineurin since uh, uh, you don't need strong immune suppression, but you need something which could be uh, acting as anti cancer, especially uh, vascular tumors such as Kaposi sarcoma. And also, uh, it, 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 it have an effect against virus, CMV, for example. So I think the role of mTOR is mainly when we have a problem using calcium urine, I can switch to uh, uh, mTOR, or an elderly, or if I have, a, in particular, vascular tumor, especially Kaposi sarcoma. But uh, uh, if we go to Kaposi sarcoma, uh, and mTOR. Again, mTOR is expensive drug. We have a big experience, I think, uh, regarding Kaposi sarcoma, even before appearance of uh, uh, mTOR. And I think we successfully treated our patient with simple reduction of net immune suppression. We have many patients patient like that. Uh, I'm not against, again, uh, uh, using or switching to Raba in addition with Kapusi, but why not to try reducing the net immune suppression 
and so far you are succeeding to reduce the size of the tumor, go on with this policy. But if it is very aggressive tumor, such as vascular Kaposi, or there is a resilient course, you start adding a method. Uh, again, I'm looking for the economy. Uh, the point is that we in our urology nephrology center, we don't uh, look to these issues seriously, since uh, 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 we can buy uh, all these drugs. <laughs> but uh, uh, if any, uh, if you are looking for a man who is paying for his medication, uh, whether totally or partially, and you know that people uh, followed by the medical insurance or uh, uh, Dawa, I mean, uh, covered by the uh, by the government, usually they pay partially for their immune suppression. So if you have a patient like this, uh, switching to lower immune suppression protocol will cost a lot of money for these poor people. Okay, okay, Dr. The Muhammad. Story of uh, 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 steroid withdrawal. Yes. Uh, of course, it is something brilliant, uh, uh, attractive. A calcium urine uh, uh, omission uh, or stopping or minimization, steroid withdrawal, good headings, titles. But on my gut feeling, on triple, you are safer than on double. Uh, there was a very good uh, uh, paper, uh, it is not recent one, but uh, it is a good one which has been published by uh, Bekahari, I think, uh, in which he, uh, he gave his patient uh, uh, the triple immune suppression, and after one year, he divided them into three groups, either to uh, uh, quit from cyclosporin uh, uh, or to uh, steroid, and compared the three arm, but at the end he found that giving the three arm, three medication, is better than any two drugs. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Hussain, when you gave the good result of uh, successful uh, steroid um, uh, avoidance uh, or rapid withdrawal, you said in a low risk patient. Yes, yes. No, yes, and this is one of the most important point, Dr. Muhammad, regarding reading in a randomized controlled trial, is to know that the results are linked to the demographics. If we are on the elderly, it should be elderly, low immunological risk and low immunological risk. Absolutely. I agree with you. So, and this opens, if we uh, respect the demographics, this will open the horizon for personalized immune suppression. Again. And, I, and I agree with you 100%. When we, when we decided to participate in transplantation in one of the African countries, we bought all the, the cost as, one, as an important pillar for selecting immune suppressive drugs. Uh, frequently we see in our press in the Orange Foreign Center, you have a patient who is uh, PRA0, uh, uh, three match. He is a, a good omen case, and you are surprised with acute rejections coming. Uh, in this patient. Okay. Uh, um, and this is in the, in, in the concordance with the study that I just uh, mentioned, HLA identical uh, cables and there is risk of rejection because of the drastic reduction right. of immune suppression. So we right. should be mastering in a smart way immune suppression in all patients. If you allow me, Professor Sobh, I want to hear from Dr. Kosi uh, a statement yeah. to, to start the generic and, uh, and the biosimilars. Okay. Yes, Dr. Kosi. Okay. Professor Hussain, we're all good. Uh, just two points, probably, and a very interesting discussion. Uh, the two points that I am just interested in about the uh, rabamycin. Yes. And the mTOR inhibitor, our experience in the UK is mainly rabamycin. We don't have that much experience with the Everonimus, like the states, or like ourselves, okay? So the, uh, there are some rules, I mean, some places for the rabamycin still can help. And I can just give you briefly, very quickly, in a case, it's not a kidney transplant. It is a lung transplant, which is very interesting to me. And I don't know from where this EGFR is prohibitive if it is less than 40 mils per minute, not to switch it into the rabamycin. I don't know from where the, I mean, the, it is the recommendation, but I don't know the origin for that. The anyway. origin from, from a status for conversion, Dr. Kosi. Uh, okay. Conversion, when it was tested, if it's immediate, far as less than 40, uh, conversion, secondary conversion of immune suppression was 
uh, ineffective. It's it the same for the study, Mahsen. Yes. Uh, okay, the question is, why I'm saying that? Because this is a native kidney. The, the patient with the lung transplant who came to me has got, I mean, uh, been transplanted just a year ago, very nice kidney function, normal kidney function, EGFR of around 60 mLs per minute, and has been transplanted with the lung, and she's been on tacrolimus, been just after six months of using the tacrolimus and steroids and the MMF, the EGFR went down to around 24, 20, 14. There is no other explanation except the tacrolimus causing the trouble. So the question was to put the patient on the transplant waiting list to go for a kidney transplant like she has got already a lung transplant. And I've had a discussion because the EGFR is less than 40. I was under the impression because it is not a kidney transplant, it is a native kidney. So I've had a discussion with the lung transplant physician. And I've told them that there is no way except either to stop the tacrolimus, which is very serious for this patient to lose her lung, and it will be obviously life-saving, or to put her on the transplant waiting list for the kidney transplant. And she said, she said that, I've got a good experience with the rabamycin. Let us stop the, the tacrolimus altogether and put the patient on the rabamycin while her EGFR is 12. And she has got this lung transplant. Now we have been 12 months after stopping the tacrolimus, her EGFR is 24 after stopping the tacrolimus. Her lung transplant is going very well. Obviously, we can't apply this to the kidney transplant, but it's going very well. Proteinuria is just only 0.4 gram per 24 hour, obviously increased, but not to the point to make you very anxious what's going on. The only problem is the anemia, and obviously the anemia is, just can be treated very easily with the, I mean, the EVO and the iron infusion. So I can see that there is still a role for the rapamycin. I mean, and you can use it in certain situations. And the case that it is not having anti-cancer effect, it definitely has got anti-proliferative effect. And like the Professor Sopha said that with the vascular tumors, it is very interesting. And you know about the angiomyeloma with the everolimus. And the interesting thing about it, if it is not having any anti-cancer effect, at least the other immunosuppression has got cancer effect or an immunosuppressive effect by stopping or reducing them uh, in favor of the rapamycin. So I believe that there is a rule occasionally, and I concur with the uh, Professor Hussain when he said that it should be individualized or personalized immunosuppression for each case. The second point about the generic, obviously you are going to discuss this issue extensively. And uh, you can't have an experience with the generic more than if you have got a massive uh, involvement in the transplantation, like I mean on a national level, let, than, let, uh, Dr. Rukosi, let us. I'm not going to write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah let, no, I'm not going to do that. Let us go to Bonn after the presentation right, of the okay. clinical pharmacy That's team. Okay. Um, and I, uh, I have a lot of slides, but I know the time is passing. Time, we are racing against time. Right. And uh, uh, so I, uh, I prefer to stop at this point and to invite uh, the clinical pharmacy team with us. We have today. Uh, to uh, clinical pharmacist, Dr. Alai Shiwi, and to da Dr. Dalia Magdi, and they will uh, discuss with us uh, the issue of generic and the biosimilar. But I prefer before they it was before they their starting is to start as, or to gather this poll to just to have your voting about two questions and um, uh, or this poll and then to continue with them. Dr. Halawa, do you see this ball? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Please uh, uh, vote. Uh, I invite all the attendees to vote on the questions. The first question, generic immune suppressants are approved to be released in the market based upon bioequivalent study on healthy volunteers, clinical trials on transplanted patient, safety and efficacy study. Just select one of these three choices. The okay. second question, Two choices are right here, but uh, oh. anyway. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> well, just do one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, only one. I think uh, the, 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 the vote will not accept. Ex uh, uh, ex oh, yeah, I can tell yes. yeah. Yeah. Please go to the vote. Do you support the prescription of generic immune suppression to renal transplant recipient? Yes or no? We can't submit. Yes, submit. Nasbit submit, eh? 
I can't submit, I don't know. Oh, it's just a minute. Okay. Probably. No. Okay. So it seems that you need to answer the all, the, the all questions. The third, the third question. Yes. I third I question, not, not related to generic, which one of the following has anti-COVID-19, tacrolimus cyclosporin, MMF, which of the following the, the least metabolized, uh, immediate release, advagraph, inversus, which is avoided, to be avoided with steroid, statin, as anti-slipidemic drug, statin, as it as it BCSK9 bile acid sequestrant. They are, these are five questions related to the immune suppression and not to the generic only. And uh, so uh, we'll continue until a uh, certain point of time and then we will stop. And I think we will continue another session on immune suppression because we have very hot issues related to the immune suppression drug interaction that needs a lot of time. Please uh, go rapid in voting and share in vote because uh, I have here 28, 29, 30 participated. So I give 30 seconds and then to start the next presentation. So I stop. I stop here. In the in the bowling here, thirty-five attendee. This is the end. And here, this is the chair results. To just to to see. Do you see the results, Ahmed? So this is the. So I think, the answer. Uh, I like the answers. So I stop here, I close. Please, Dr. Ala, share your presentation. Open it and minimize and open it from the chair. So the, the, the poll uh, shows the variability in answers. This means that we have the, this presentation is very valuable and we will continue the immune suppression interaction, I think, next time. Uh, Dr. Ala, Please share your presentation. I'm going to help her. Yes, I allowed you to share, yes. Regarding the question of uh, COVID-19 and immune suppression. Okay, they share the screen, I stop here. Okay. Uh, Just a moment, Ala. Unmute. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hussain, could you yes. hear me? Yes, I hear you well. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, Before you are starting your presentation, I would like to introduce you to the community. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ala Shiwi is one of the very active. Uh, okay member in the clinical pharmacy department at Urology and Nefer Center. She is well dedicated. Mm -hmm. uh, she and Dr. Dalia Magdi uh, are excellent in their attitude and they share us in the clinical rounds and the, uh, many times they reviewed medications and, shift and uh, uh, attract our attention to uh, some errors and we get the benefit from their presence with us uh, at Urology and Nefer Center. And I'm happy today that you share us in, the, in this uh, webinar uh, to speak about generic immune suppression and transplantation. And before you start, the, our dogma in transplantation, we don't like generic. This is the dogma. And yes. today I, am, I am waiting to hear from you and from Dr. Al-Qusi and Dr. Halawa, because Dr. Halawa in advance uh, mentioned his statement. So, but our opinion up to this point of time, we respect innovator drug rather than generic. So okay. we, are, we are expecting uh, new data from Dr. Ala and Dr. Dalia. 
Yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Hussein, we'd like to thank you for giving us this platform uh, to talk and to give a little glimpse of our work as a clinical pharmacist. So uh, the uh, debate of using generic immune suppressants in transplantation is highly debated and the transplant community has been divided has been divided. Uh, a part of them are in favor of using um, generic immune suppressants because, because of the cost saving and also because, because the generic medication used in the United States of America has increased from 19% of all prescribed drugs in 1984 to 75% in 2009. However, those who are against the use of generic immune suppressants, they say that the current criteria for the drug approval are not rigorous enough, and there is a lack of high quality bioequivalence studies between the innovator and generics, especially in children, and the neurotherapeutic nature of CNIs and mTORs make it a little bit difficult to make like uh, changes in the serum concentration which will have a major adverse event on the patient. So our answer to this question will be based on, first we're gonna review the drug approval process, and then we're gonna talk about the drug agency's criteria, talk about the position statements from transplant communities, and also review the clinical literature by Dr. Dahlia. So for a generic drug to seek approval process, he must demonstrate both of the following. He must demonstrate pharmaceutical equivalence, which means he must have the same active constituents with the same concentration, same route of administration, and also uh, the same or similar manufacturing techniques. And he also should demonstrate bioequivalence, which means there are no clinical meaningful differences in absorption and the weight and the extent of the absorption. So bioequivalence will eventually mean equivalence of both pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So for the drug to be approved, he must demonstrate bioequivalence through bioequivalence study done on healthy volunteers. It's a crossover design uh, done on 12 to 36 healthy volunteers that will receive one dose of the drug and one dose of the innovator uh, of the brand and one dose of the generic. And then we're gonna measure the pharmacokinetics parameters AUC, which will serve as a surrogate for uh, the rate, uh, the extent of absorption, and the Cmax and the Tmax, from which we will calculate the rate of absorption. Uh, study دي إن أنا عايز أثبت إن هي not a clinical trial. ما فيش أي safety. لا. Continue in English. Continue in English. Okay. Professor Shar Mawdas. Okay. Uh, the reason why the reason why I'm saying I'm talking about this crossover study is to emphasize that the approval process is not done on based on clinical trials done on patients, and also it's done on healthy volunteers and it's not a steady state uh, measurement, uh, and also there is no measurement of safety and efficacy. So the professional transplant societies have generated skepticism of this approval process. They have stated that kinetics profile of generic drugs and innovators in healthy volunteers will not reflect those in transplant. Also, bioequivalence is done between generic and brand. There is no bioequivalence study done between generics and generics. And also, high-risk patients may have specific bioequivalence concerns. And as I mentioned before, it's not a steady state. It's only a one dose given to the patient, and then we have to demonstrate that both kinetic profiles are similar. So the ultimate question comes, should we include transplant patients in this approval process or not? Well, in, in, to support the agencies, drug agencies that do not prefer using the transplant patients, they, they say that transplant patients represent a heterogeneous population. We will have to make a subpopulation of both drug absorbers. And also there is a large degree of inter and intra-individual variations, which will mean much larger sample size and also recruitment will be limited. So till this very moment, they prefer to do it on healthy volunteers. However, ESPERIT in 2011, which is the organization responsible for efficacy and safe prescription in transplantation, they have stated that licensed bioequivalence does not automatically mean clinically bioequivalence in practice. This statement means that uh, we, when we make one-to-one -one dose conversion, that does not automatically mean that the generic will fulfill the same trap level as the brand. And sometimes we will have to make those adjustments either by increasing 
or decreasing the dose, and this will be explained by Dr. Dalia. So what are the criteria for licensing genetics? Now we have established by equivalence study. Uh, now, when we will say that these drugs are approved. Now, the FDA do not differentiate between neurotherapeutic index drugs and the normal drugs. They present a wide range of an acceptance of 90% confidence interval for both AUC and CMAX, which is between 80% to 125%. However, the European Medicine Association they have, uh, in 2010, they have differentiated between a neurotherapeutic index and, an, uh, and the other drugs, and they have uh, stated stricter criteria for for CNIs and mTORs, which would be between 90 and 100%. When it comes to Canada, uh, they have stated that the AUC will be in the wide range and CMAX will be in the uh, stricter range. Uh, so, as we have said before, not all immune suppressants are considered neurotherapeutic index. Uh, uh, Antibiorephritive, such as azathioprine and the MMF, are not considered neurotherapeutic index drugs in the eyes of the AMA and the FDA. And that's why this article says that substitution of these drugs can be taken with confidence that the efficacy will be maintained without increased harm. However, substitution for CNIs and mTORs will, must be undertaken with caution and careful monitoring. So the question arises is, are all generics completely identical to their innovators? When it comes to the active constituents, we have established the fact that they are completely identical, but when it comes to excipients, they are different. But is there a clinical impact of this difference? Yes, there is, as this article has stated that, as we all know, there is, a, there is an interaction between cyclosporin and serolimus. Cyclosporin increases the level of serolimus, and that's why there is a four, a four hour time separation between the two drugs. But say, for instance, that the physician have managed that the level of uh, serolimus will be maintained based on this interaction. They have changed the cyclosporine from the brand, which is neural, to the uh, generic, which is GenGraph. And they have uh, noticed that the serum concentration of serolimus has decreased by 29%. The, Explanation for this is that uh, GenGraph has a different excipient, and therefore there was a time lag when it comes to absorption, and there was a delayed Tmax. So this interaction did not happen, which resulted in, in Cmax of serolimus, which was out of the range. So it's very important to note that there could be drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions, and that's why whenever we make switching, we have to make close monitoring of the drug levels, not only of the generic, but also of the accompanied drugs co-administered. So when it comes to generic to generic substitution, do we support it or not? Mm -hmm. As we have said before, uh, the bioequivalent studies are not made between uh, generic to generic. They're only made between the generic and the brand. And if we say, for instance, uh, like FDA, the approval range was wide between 80 to 1 and 25 percent. So if one generic was accepted on the lower limit, which is 80 percent, and another was accepted on the higher limit, which was 125 percent. If we switch from this, uh, from this generic to the other generic, we will have a tremendous uh, like a tremendous difference when it comes to the AUC and CMAX. It's like 45%. So what will happen is called a generic drift. And the generic drift will have a huge impact when it comes clinically to the pharmacokinetics parameters. So if we cannot establish a bioequivalence between the generics, it's not advised to make such a substitution. When it comes to the position statements of professional societies, for instance, uh, the Canadian Society of Transplantation, they have said that there are insufficient literature regarding efficacy and safety. They also recommended to make close monitoring with any change, and it's not recommended to use generics in pediatric patients. When it comes to ESOT, they have said that generic formulations that do not meet the stricter criteria provided by the AMA and Canada should not be used, and they have stated that repetitive substitution should be avoided. So, uh, we have this question, and I would like to hear from you. Is it ethical, ethical to prescribe generic immune suppressants to renal transplant patients or not? So, I would like to hear from you. 
when it comes. Do, do, you, do you like to hear from uh, yes, Dr. I would, Professor Kousi yes. or okay. to uh, leave the room for Dr. Dalia to continue and then to have the comments of, of our experts? Okay. If you would like me to proceed? Yes, we like to. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kousi, what's yes. your Yes. So, uh, your question is it ethical or is it legal or it is both? Yes. Oh, is it both. ethical <laughs> or, or both? To be honest. <laughs> Want to know your opinion regarding to both? To yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. support this opinion with some conditions. We can talk about mm -hmm. the conditions after you finish. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. my opinion is the same as yours. We will make. We will say that it is ethical, but with conditions. We have to establish cost-effectiveness analysis, which means that we will have to see if this change is cost-effective and it will not affect the graft function, it will not affect the patient, it will not cause increase in hospitalization due to uh, rejections or not. And also we will have to make risk minimization through uh, publishing policies that will choose who, whoever will benefit from this uh, change. Do all transplant uh, patients can benefit from uh, switching to generic uh, immune suppressants or we can make it with some limitations like for instance giving it to stable renal transplant patients rather than giving it to high risk patients and things like that so if you could establish both of them which is cost effectiveness analysis if we could make sure that the drug is uh, effective and safe and at the same time it will make a huge difference when it comes to cost yes it is ethical to prescribe the generic drug the second uh, scope of this presentation is we're going to talk about biosimilars. Biosimilars are considered copies of biological drugs like hormones or monoclonal antibodies or any drug that's taken from a healthy cell or healthy living cell. Uh, it is also developed after the patent has expired. Biosimilars are very similar to the reference product, but they are virtually never the same. But they must demonstrate that there is no clinically meaningful differences when it comes to safety, purity, potency uh, between biosimilars and their innovator biologics. So can we consider biosimilars to be biogeneric or not? The answer is no, because when it comes to the active constituent, as we have stated before, they are not copies of the reference medicine. There is a change in the sequence of uh, an inactive component, uh, and therefore the approval process will be completely different from that of the generic. Uh, the agencies require from the biosimilar companies to demonstrate clinical studies, which is phase one and phase three and four, to demonstrate effectiveness, safety, and immunogenicity. So what are the points of concerns when it comes to switching to biosimilars? Most of the physicians are very afraid of the immunogenicity, which is the ability of the drug to trigger the immune system and to start uh, producing antibodies against this drug. Now, switching between, between brand and biosimilars could increase this immunogenicity and therefore render the patient unresponsive to both the biosimilar and to the innovative biologic. However, the FDA have uh, developed a new criteria for approval of biosimilars in 2015 and they have stated that the biosimilars drugs should demonstrate immunogenicity assays. They should uh, measure the uh, antibodies in the patient's uh, serum against the drugs and also they, uh, they should perform a switching on in the clinical trials to demonstrate that the switching between the brand and biosimilar will not result in immunogenicity. The second concern is substitution, which is done on the level of the pharmacy. Now, can a pharmacist uh, like dispense a biosimilar instead of the innovator biologic without, uh, without the consultation of the doctor or not? Uh, in Europe, it's considered illegal to do something like that unless the biosimilar company demonstrates something called interchangeability study, which will make uh, the biosimilar in the market interchangeable and it can make one-to-one -one dose conversion. If it can prove something like that, then a substitution can be done without referring to the physician. So what are the available biosimilars transplantation at this very moment? 
When it comes to rituximab, we have two biosimilars presented by Celetrion, which got the AMA, FDA, Korea, and Australia approval. And also we have the one called Rexathon by Sandoz, which got the approval in AMA and Australia. And I have a comment when, uh, for the Sandoz rituximab because they tried to seek FDA approval, but the FDA agents have rejected their application because uh, the rituximab did not match their criteria when it comes to immunogenicity. So uh, when it comes to the hospital, if you're trying to introduce biosimilars, it's very important to check where these biosimilars are approved. And it's very important to know the criteria of these agencies for this approval because it's very important to ensure safety. The second biosimilar is Pilatacept, which is produced by Alphamap. It's not released in the market yet because it's still in the clinical trial phase, in phase three. But this drug has proven to be, so far, as effective and as similar as Pilatacept. And when it's introduced, it will be a major breakthrough for the patients because they will benefit from Pilatacept, but with a much cheaper price. And now we're going to move to the clinical trials by Dr. Dalia. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dalia uh, because she is very, uh, she has a very nice attitude as Ala, and uh, always uh, we are happy to to, uh, to work together in a team, and uh, all the time wh while they are doing the clinic around with us, uh, there uh, there is very nice discussions and hot issues, and I am sure that she will add a lot to the issue of generic and the biosimilars from the clinical trial. Dr. Dalia Magdi, Fadal. Thank you, Dr. Hussain, uh, for presenting me. I am honored to be with you. Uh, here we will uh, review some clinical trials about generic drugs uh, that are approved from FDA or EMA or uh, Health Canadian. Here, drugs is approved and uh, be in the market. Uh, then um, hospitals make clinical trials to share its experience uh, with generic drugs or uh, for companies that, um, make it make uh, clinical trials to uh, approve that uh, it's a generic drug um, uh, like or bioequivalence brand drugs. Um, I will focus on uh, generic drugs in Egyptian market and I will start with the uh, Arbamune, uh, generic of neural. Here we have two clinical, trial, clinical trials, one uh, uh, about um, uh, 20 uh, uh, de novo kidney transplant patient. Um, they was uh, follow for one year. Uh, they uh, follow uh, the C2 level uh, and make a comparison with uh, in neural. Um, in conclusion, uh, Arbamune was the same with neural, but Arbamune need to increase the dose uh, to um, achieve trough level, target level. Second one, uh, on uh, 30 de novo kidney transplant patient, uh, here uh, he was the follow for six months, uh, follow AUC, C2, uh, adverse event, here mean um, uh, infection and uh, hyperlipidemia adverse, uh, as a uh, adverse effect. We um, uh, they compare the uh, kidney function calculated uh, uh, creatinine clearance, um, conclusion was the neural and arbamune was the same, but uh, in renal allograft function um, with minimal rate of acute restriction and the adverse event in the arbamune arm. Uh, in USA, uh, there are many uh, generation of cyclosporin, uh, the most of them uh, gene graph and uh, ecoral gene graph for uh, company Abbott and the ecoral uh, for Invexus. Um, many, many, many studies uh, made about uh, uh, its bioequivalence and they all uh, said that they have uh, interchangeable uh, for each other, draft level was same, um, no uh, change in uh, AUC. Uh, but um, there is an uh, uh, exception, uh, one uh, trial uh, from 188 uh, de novo kidney transplant in the genograph arm, uh, the uh, antibody mediated rejection episode was uh, more and the patient need to take antibody mediated uh, rejection treatment. Uh, the second for 80 uh, kidney transplant uh, recipient, uh, there was uh, significant uh, changes in trough level. And I will uh, talk about uh, the cornerstone uh, of uh, 
transplantation uh, tacrolimus and it's generic. Uh, in the USA, there are many generics and uh, also all studies say that they have the same trough level, uh, have the same uh, effect on serum creatinine. Um, AUC is the same, no difference um, between uh, innovator and uh, el and uh, genetics, but, but I will focus on um, tacrolimus for uh, Sandoz as it uh, uh, sometimes be in the Egyptian market. This is a study in um, uh, uh, kidney transplant uh, unit in Barcelona. Uh, in, uh, this, in hospital, they would uh, have a uh, prograph and then shift it to um, Adbert or uh, Tacrolimus for Sandoz, uh, they make a historical um, trials uh, comparing the uh, result of uh, Adbert to uh, a recorded uh, result of Prograph. Um, this uh, trial they made on 120 kidney transplant patients. They didn't uh, classify the patient according to low risk or high risk. All patients uh, uh, go to the trial. Um, uh, they compare uh, trough level, uh, AUC, uh, delayed graft function, uh, and uh, after six months, they make a protocol biopsy, and they calculated the uh, uh, creatinine clearance by CKD API equation. The result was the um, trough level uh, after seven days, one month, three months, and six months between prograft and adbert was comparable. Um, in adbert uh, arm, uh, some patient um, uh, reach the level faster than prograph. Um, uh, the result of uh, L, uh, protocol biopsy was uh, similar in the two arms, and the GFR was um, the same. Yang, the same in most um, in most case. Yang, uh, but this study has a limitation as. Um, it is a retrospective uh, uh, with the historical controlled group, and they didn't uh, make any economic cost and uh, uh, didn't say uh, how many, um, uh, how much money uh, they uh, save from when shifting from prograph to genera to, to uh, generic uh, drugs. Yeah. Uh, this is the second and the very interesting trial. They uh, compare an innovator program with two generic uh, product, one of them for uh, Dr. Reddy uh, company and the second for uh, uh, for company Santos. Um, they, uh, this is the only trial I have uh, uh, said that it was prospective from uh, uh, two, uh, 2013 uh, 2014, it was a crossover, uh, blinding, and uh, um, um, crossover randomized uh, trial. Uh, they classified uh, a patient, patient uh, go in this uh, trial was um, stable kidney function, has no uh, acute uh, or rejection except in the first uh, year of transplantation. Uh, uh, in this trial, um, the patient is the, to be to uh, the control, you know, to uh, um, limit the intra uh, uh, individual variation and the uh, genetic polymorphism uh, between the patient. Um, yeah, classified to three groups, and uh, in each group, the patient uh, takes the uh, double treatment. Uh, one uh, uh, innovator and uh, one generic, one um, the second generic. Uh, then uh, they take uh, samples uh, after trough level, uh, two minutes, uh, 40 minutes, uh, two hours, three hours, two, uh, and 12 hours to uh, draw an AUC. The AUC war, uh, uh, the AUC between uh, an innovator and uh, a generic one, generic two was uh, comparable. Uh, a generic uh, for sure, Dr. Reddy, the blue uh, line was uh, higher than uh, the innovator and was slightly higher than an EMA criteria. This is the uh, result was uh, comparable. And limitations uh, also, the sample size was low and it didn't uh, uh, make the economic uh, um, 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 cost saving from shifting uh, uh, the generic drugs. A conclusion that this uh, three drugs, the innovator and the two generics are bioequivalents to each other.
um, in Egypt, we have uh, only septurate as a generic for uh, uh, salsep. Toradalia. Uh, uh, I prefer to stop here to hear from okay. the experts their opinion uh, regarding okay. the, the immune suppressive drugs and to hear from them from the practical point of view which generics they used and how they followed uh, this. But before uh, they uh, uh, have their comments, here in Egypt, we have uh, trusting uh, using a generic in nephrotic syndrome treatment. Since more than 15 years, we use generic for nephrotic syndrome based upon uh, cyclosporin level, for example. It is a good uh, to, give, um, to give us idea about the confidence in using in uh, nephrotic syndrome. But when we think of transplant, we decided to uh, use only innovators uh, up to this moment in the Egyptian market. We prefer innovators to be used in transplantation exclusively because we are afraid of, uh, of anything that interfere with the uh, transplant success and outcome. So I'd like to hear from Professor Kosi, Professor Halawa, and Professor Sharma about their experience and their um, advices and comments about these two presentations. Dr. Kosi. Thank you very much. Many thanks for this excellent presentation. I think that very, very excellent presentations, both of you. And the time is pressing for, I mean, for all yes. of us. Just only two points I need to highlight here. A, the anti-metabolite, the mycophenolate, as you can see from the LAI presentation, you don't have that much of the concerns about the substitution because we don't do levels. This is A. Sometimes mm -hmm. we stop all of them altogether without any problem. B, mm -hmm. I mean, even the uh, uh, legislation or approval of these drugs didn't have that much, I mean, rigorous uh, approval. So if the drug, like say, for example, the uh, any uh, mycophenolate or mycophenolic acid approved by the MEA or Canadian or FDA, I believe that we can use it straight away without any concerns, without any problems. This is my feeling. And it for us, in our experience, it has saved us 90% of the price. So you can imagine from CELSEP to the generic one, yeah, I mean, it is a massive, massive saving. As regards the CNI, I will be a bit cautious. You can see that I will not go for the FDA approval because it's a wide window between the AUC and the CMAX. I will go for the MEA or Canadian or even the Mexican. They have got a very tight in one and very, very narrow window. And once I have got that, I will see how much saving I'm going to have. If the saving is significant, and I mean, for the money-wise, because it's the main thing is the money. If it is definitely will make difference, then I will take it and I will just do the, I mean, the uh, trial. We ourselves in the UK, we are using the Adaport, which is the Sanders one for the Tacrolimus. And it saves a lot for ourselves. Once we use the, the Adaport, a week later, it's, I mean, the same ratio of the dose for the prograph. And after a week, we do the levels again, and we, found, we didn't find that much huge differences. For the, so the CNI, I should be very careful when I'm prescribing generic. I have to prescribe it by brand, rather than by generic like the mycophenolate. You, say, you should say at a board, not to say if it is going to say. If it is going for the children, I will be extremely cautious and not to use any generic until I make sure that it works well. This is the, maybe the short statement that I can see in terms of both of them. I like the comment because when I reviewed the issue of uh, generic and I said the statement that generics are bad in transplantation, I take it from pediatric uh, transplantation uh, publications. So for children uh, and pediatric transplantation is still up to this moment, they prefer innovator drugs uh, until further evidence. So Professor Sharma, Yes, please. Thanks, thanks very much for uh, asking me to comment on these two excellent presentations. The bottom line is that we have been using Adoport uh, without any problem, although in the initial part when we did the uh, initial investigation, uh, at the time there were some patients in whom the drug levels were a little bit higher than uh, others, uh, than their previous uh, drug levels on uh, the prograph. Uh, I must uh, really, uh, I'm really very keen to uh, mention our experience about in 1995, our department was uh, the, one of the centers for uh, multi-trial, multi-center trial for conversion from send immune to neural. And we had some patients who lost their graft 
because of uh, the drug levels uh, on neural compared to sending mean were quite high and this was in spite of very close monitoring so the uh, what i would like to say is that if there are clear cut financial benefits of conversion to a generic drug uh, then yes there is a reason to do that but most importantly patient should be able to come for a close follow up and we should be able to do very reliable monitoring of drug levels before saying yes this is effective and this works for us thank you thank you very much, you very uh, much. Professor, sharma, uh, professor sharma for uh, your nice comments um, again the question is when we have uh, when we think to change our mind regarding using generic tacrolimus is the drug level is enough is it enough uh, dr halawa what's your opinion regarding this point you know a drug level is one of the factors yes uh, but not enough, you know, um, uh, side effects as well, you know, tolerance, tolerability, you know, uh, um, most importantly, to, to be immunologically bioequivalent, because, you know, what's the point of having the same drug level and patient is rejecting? Yes. Uh, we know that the drug level, not necessarily uh, um, uh, checking the right uh, drug needs to be checked, could be checking metabolite as well which will, you know, add, you know, much to the water. Okay, Dr. Halao. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I finished. <laughs> so so you, you trust the use of generic? Uh, no, I, we don't trust, uh, rule in medicine, don't trust anybody. Yes. Don't trust any drug. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, we, you know, you, you know, you discover that you know, when you ask AJ in Liverpool, Royal Liverpool, um, you know, it's completely different unit, completely different, you know, uh, area away from us. You know, they have to run a pilot study before they use the generic drug. Exactly, we didn't take the results. We did, Leeds is not far from us, it's just 30 miles down the road. We didn't take the results. We tried ours, we did ours as well, you know, because you have to justify to the local authority. But you did it on, on patients, transplant patients, not volunteers. Of course, well, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. The transplant patients, stable transplant patients, not yes. volunteers. Yes. Okay. Can I add a last comment? Yes, please, please. please. Uh, thank you very much. It is just be, I urge yourselves because you are leading for the transplant. Yes. And in, in Egypt, the practice is there are some private and the people they are writing, prescribing for the patients. So if something comes from yourselves to say that this generic for the CNI works well, I'm sure that the authorities will take this, I mean, and everybody in Egypt will take it if it's going to save money because it is at the end of the day, it is from the pocket of the patient, not from only the country. It is from everybody. So okay. it will stay. So it is, I mean, a duty by yourselves. Dr. Sharma. <laughs> Just a very simple comment, you know, uh, as you can see, uh, humor has got such a tremendous role in uh, teaching and education. But coming to the main point, I was going to say that the drug levels are at the most uh, really uh, convincing right, uh, the surrogate marker of uh, the drug's efficacy. But it's not everything. You need to really look at the overall clinical benefit and, of course, the, uh, the side effects. So uh, it is only a surrogate marker of immunosuppression. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, for your comment. Dr. Ala and Dr. Dalia, do you want to add anything? Unmute. Okay. Yes. Um, our home message uh, was about uh, using a generic uh, under restricted uh, condition for. Uh, so, do you like. Do you like European Medical Agency uh, guidelines yes. or FDA? Like because, uh, European. Because why European? Uh, restrict, more restriction, uh, uh, small level, uh, ranges is small. The, the Allah, yes. Ranges, you, yes. You mentioned and that uh, uh, there is Canadian, European. Yes, there is Canadian. Canadian. Yes, European. And, 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 and you mentioned that Canada follows a thought in this uh, issue. No, Canada, we can say that Canada took like uh, the same as FDA when it comes to the uh, AUT and CMAX when it comes to European. Mm -hmm. But yes. we like to take the European or AMA approved uh, drugs because the strict 
uh, criteria or the strict range gives more confidence that this generic drug is more likely to resemble the uh, brand drug when it comes to the kinetic profile. However, we need to make clinical trials. That does not mean that these drugs, once they are in the market, it's very ready to take it from the shelf and put it in the patient. We have to make clinical trials. We have to make close monitoring. We have to seek for drug levels and also for side effects of these drugs. We no, have no, to pay no. attention to the stable kidney transplant patients. Mm -hmm. We do not use it in high risk patients. We do not use it in pediatrics or geriatrics. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I can see and can say that mm -hmm. if there is uh, no money issue, we mm -hmm. do not need to make the switch from the brand. Okay, thank you very much. And I think you, you were successful in your presentation. You changed our mind from uh, the dogma of closing the, the, the door for generic at all to mm -hmm. open the door by prerequisites. So we, we start to think of uh, this point is to test the newcomers of generics in the, in the market, of the Egyptian market, for stable transplantation pilot study, as Professor Halawa mentioned. And if they prove in, in our patients to be successful, then the price, the price, the, the cost is one of the eminent and eminent pillar in selecting drugs. Mm -hmm. So if they reduce money, with uh, the, the outcome the same, why you don't save money? Save allow money. me also, also, <laughs> also, Dr. Hussein, could you allow me to say yeah. something? Yes. That, uh, where Dr. Dalia was about to say that in some patients we had to make those, uh, we have to make uh, 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 those adjustments. We, we, uh, we had to increase the dose, so the cost was not reduced. Uh, okay. In trials, yeah, doc Dr. Mimini, trials, they uh, add, uh, uh, close monitoring uh, cost for the cost uh, um, minimize this is this is in the study but after the, uh, okay this is in the study environment is to keep eye when we have a study even it's pilot study to keep eye on the patients following up meticulously more frequently and this will cost money but at the yes. end of the day when it become proven to be effective as it was proven in some countries outside the our territory then we will save a lot of money. Do you but know? Sometimes, but do, sometimes, do you but know? sometimes the, do, the dose reduction is, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. we did not make dose reduction. We mm -hmm. had to increase the dose of the generic drugs. So it was more costing money. Yeah, but, but, this, is, but this is not mm -hmm. general. If, yes, if, this is not general, but. Excuse me, Ala. Excuse me, Ala. If, if I increase the dose of generic and the generic cost will exceed the, the innovator drug or become similar or mm -hmm. near the innovator, I yes. should omit, I shouldn't use the generic drug at all. Yes, and this was seen That's most, uh, more frequently with if this not, If this 10%, as Professor Kosi mentioned, if it saves the money, 90% safe costing, uh, it, is, it is fantastic. Dr. Kosi. There, there is a number, I am not sure of it, uh, the United States has saved a trillion dollars within the last 10 years in just saving for the, using the generics for the immunosuppression. Okay. Unfortunately, Dr. K Dr. Kosai, the cost effectiveness analysis did not include hospitalization, did not include medications given to the patient. So uh, we should put, ala, 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 we should put no. this in our mind. And yes. at, the end no. of the day, at the end of the day, outside the trial, the pilot okay. study, if the generic was proven and was proven to be cost effective and of low cost, um, uh, I am going to support the use of generic in this situation. Thank you very much, Ala and uh, Dalia, for your excellent Thank presentation. You we are proud you. of you and with your uh, confidence and your presentation, and we'll start to change our mind. Dear guests and, uh, and experts, Professor Sharma, Professor Halawa, Professor Kousi, I, um, I appreciate your presence with us today. You enriched this meeting and uh, uh, I have still, uh, I just presented 30% 30, 30 of my slides and we have Dr. Af Ahmed Afatah slides. So it is better to have another meeting uh, to arrange for the second because drug-drug interactions and lessons of drug interactions are of very amount of importance. Uh, do you like to, to, to organize another session to discuss Drug direct interaction in special issues or to stop at this point, Dr. Halal? Uh, actually, it's very interesting actually, drug direct interaction, and it's all about immunosuppression is basically toxicity and drug, drug, drug interaction. 
So, um, uh, you know, uh, are you especially are, you know, there is a special uh, sector of COVID 19 and how to manipulate immune suppression in COVID 19 and the drug drug interaction with uh, presumed anti COVID therapy with immune suppression. A lot of hot issues, this lipidemia and the statin and others. And uh, I think we, uh, after a couple of days after Eid, uh, we will uh, have uh, another session. And I invite you. Professor Kosi and the Professor Sharma to be with us because your presence in, uh, is, uh, is invaluable. Uh, so oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for us. Actually, we enjoyed this meeting and looking forward, you know, for uh, the, you know, the uh, third part because you have the first part. Unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't attend because it's actually right on, the, you know, you know uh, passing So I, I, I'll phone you to arrange the best time for uh, all, of, uh, all of you. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I'm happy by the presence of all attendees. Thank you very much for attending, for uh, asking, for interactions, and hoping you to see you uh, soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.